Hi, I'm John Broxton for the International Film Music Critics Association, and I'm very pleased to be able to present four awards for Composer of the Year, Best Original Score for a Horror Film, Composition of the Year for The Piper, and the Kyle Running Special Award for Nosferatu to Chris Young. Many congratulations, Chris. Oh, John, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. This is a, a miracle of sorts. It's a dream come true. I, I four awards. <laughs> what have I done to deserve this? How blessed, how fortunate I am. I can't thank you and the organization enough for having taken on a couple of scores here for films. Well, one of them it was a successful picture. The other one, the only future will tell. But you highlighted scores that might otherwise have been completely forgotten. So to you and the members, I'm entirely, entirely devoted to. And, and I hope that uh, the same fortune, great fortune that I've had here will, will happen to many others like myself. Thank you. So, Chris, many congratulations again on your four wins for this year. Um, John, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Um, let's start with the Piper. Obviously, this is the one that you won three awards for this year. Um, it's an interesting movie um, because you had to write a concerto before you even started writing the score. Can you tell me a little bit about that process and what that was like to write in that way? Right. Um, well, in many ways, this is a dream come true for a composer to be involved in a movie where music plays such an important part. And certainly this film is about a fl an evil flautist confronting a pure hearted flautist in, a, uh, in an orchestra uh, that uh, is in the process of putting together this cursed uh, concerto, a right. performance of it that caused the death of its original author. Um, so the exciting thing, of course, is that I knew that I was going to have the opportunity to write some music that was going to be filmed with the orchestra performing it, and I didn't have to worry about coordinating the music to the picture, right. you know. Uh, and uh, fortunately, because I've spent a lot of time listening to the 20th century stuff, the classical stuff, and I'm a tremendous fan of it. Uh, it was something that that was doable. I could I could imagine it working out. Right. Um, now it's it's it. I went out and did my uh, my homework and spent a lot of time listening to and studying flute concertos. The thing that made this different was that it was not only for flute and orchestra, but for flute, orchestra, and a children's choir. Right. And the, the, um, the director kept, uh, Erlinger, kept referring to it as the children's concerto. Hmm. I, maybe he's going to be a little miffed when he sees on, this, <laughs> on the CD that I called it the flute concerto, right. you know, because that's what it is, really. Uh, but uh, that, that immediately made it different than the others, and the inclusion of a children's choir, okay. And you worked with Dennis Spiegel. Dennis lyricist. Spiegel, the yeah. absolutely incredible lyricist, an old friend of mine. I called him and he, you know, he was the ideal lyricist for this. And the fortunate thing is with the uh, Entrada release, it's coming out on CD hopefully next month, um, they're including all of his lyrics oh, in the liner notes, which is great. Um, so yes, he came on board. Um, you know, there was a, I don't know if you knew this, but John Corleano, or however it's pronounced, yeah. Corleano, yeah. the American contemporary right. composer who also did a handful of film scores, won an Academy Award for the Red Violin. He wrote a flute concerto called The Pied Piper Fantasy. Mm. And so that was a tough one, you know, a tough act to follow. Because um, 
because it was essentially you took the same subject. It wasn't for a film, but you know, it was about the Pied Piper story, right? Um, loosely, and uh, I would have to say that fortunately, the two the two do not meet. <laughs> Well, you know. I mean, the, the stylistics of yours are quite interesting because I, I feel like you've got, you know, it's, it's very classical in parts, but it's, it also feels as though it's very influenced by like folk music a little bit in the way that it's, you know, the, the, the flute melodies that run through it. Then you've also got some very horrific parts, obviously, that relate to the story. It, it's an interesting mishmash of styles. Yes, it is. And going back to his, um, it's not really into the... The final movement in which melody becomes an important part of of his concerto. Whereas, for me, you know, I can't escape melody. I'm I'm a big melody junkie. Even when I'm working in horror films, it's hard to escape that. My favorites, of course, of going way back in the film music history books, and uh, are Max Steiner and Eric Wolfgang Korngel, two composers as well who couldn't write a note without it being generated by some melodic line. Right. And so there's, there, that's the thing I think that distinguishes this flute concerto as opposed to some of the others that I ran into that were more contemporary is that the melody, there's melodies all over the place in it. And uh, though... Uh, the main theme, the one that's identified with the Piper, we hear a tiny bit of it at the beginning of the first movement. It's the thing that opens it, but we don't really hear it again until the conclusion of the third movement. Yeah. It's really, a three-movement concerto, by the way. I, I really like that theme because it, it feels almost like a lullaby. Like, yes. It's like it's enticing, it's, it's bringing you in, and it's, it's beckoning these children, but it's also very creepy, which yeah. I guess is that interesting balance that you have to get. You know, and the interesting thing is that in the first movement, the flute plays, finally when it comes in, it does this solo line. Mm. And originally I thought, oh, this is gonna be the Piper tune. And I got a call, or I was, yeah, I heard that, the, that they all wanted to, to talk to me, uh, Erlinger and the three producers wanted to get on a conference call with me at like eight in the morning because they felt that the tune was the one, if this is it, this ain't it. Oh. And they said, you're gonna have to rethink this. So this is what I heard they were gonna say. So luckily, knowing this is what was happening, I came here, sat at this piano and knocked off, I think, four new tunes. And that morning, I had a piano r right by me, and they were we were zooming, and I said, "Listen, guys, I knew what you were going to be set. I came up with four new tunes." Right. They said, "Really?" Because they were starting to shoot in a matter of days, right. and I hadn't come up with the right tune yet. And I play the first one. They go, oh, "Okay, good." The second one, <laughs> I play the third one, and I'm noticing when I'm looking at the zoom. They're all looking at each other, Just you know. They're in, you know, whatever. You can feel something's clicking here. Right. And then I play the fourth one, and they all say essentially at the same time, "Can we hear number three again?" Yeah. And that's the one you're talking about. They knew. Yeah. I got to tell you, you know, um, you know, often composers will say that that beware the directors and producers. They don't know music. They don't know what's right for the movie. They tell you the craziest things to do, pay no attention to them. Well, actually, usually in my case, they know what's best. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't necessarily have picked that one. Really? Yeah. It must be very satisfying though when, when you know you've nailed it. Well, when they know you've nailed it, and then I start working with it and I go, now I see why they chose that, mm -hmm. you know. Because the end of the first movement, has a waltz, there's a waltz. And that was another option yeah. for the, his theme. But they, the uh, Erling or the director said, save that tune, put it in the concerto somewhere, please. Yeah. The whole second movement, which is the one I think that you, which is used in the end credits, 
again, two themes that might have been his, that he's, he's the one who said to me, Chris, how about if you take that one and you take this one and you fuse them together? Hmm. And I went, oh, well, let, let me see. Yeah. And that's what the second movie movement is. Two rejected main themes fused together, moving the, you know, finding the common key. Interesting. So, I mean, so after you finish the concerto, then you've got to adapt your own music into actual underscore. Right. I guess that was a, a new challenge. I don't think you've ever done adapting your own music into a, a different setting like that before. No. Uh, I'm thinking here. Uh, no, no, I've never done anything like that. Was that oh, challenging? Is that true? Uh, well, there was um, the film called Creation about uh -huh. the life of Charles Darwin. Right. In that one, um, his wife, um, and it was the married team. Who played, who played, who were the actors on? Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany, and he's married to? Jennifer Connelly. Jennifer Connelly. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank <laughs> you. Save, the, save me. Okay, a husband and wife playing a husband and wife. Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Charles Darwin. And in that one, she apparently, the, the real Mrs. Uh, uh, Darwin, was, uh, was a really good pianist. Yeah. And she loved the music of Chopin. And so in the film, we see her playing some Chopin pieces, except for one. And she actually got it together so the camera could be on her hands. Right. But there was one that John A. Meal, the director, shot one situation where we, the camera's behind her and her hands are moving, but we don't know, we can't see what she's playing. And he said, you have to write a theme for that one, this source cue, which is, supposed to be the daughter. The daughter, one of the daughters uh, dies in, in, in the, you know, at some part, some point in the movie. Yeah. Um, and this is, was, he said, this is, has to be her theme. Yeah. So then I got to write something which was source music, but it was done after the fact. Right. And then that became part of the score right. and you hear it in the end credits too. Yeah. Uh, but this indeed was the first time in which I got to write something as extensive as a three movement. And remember, it's 30 minutes. The, con the concerto's 30 minutes. Yeah. And I was told originally they were going to use 21 of those 30 minutes. They're going to shoot 21 of the 30. I think there's maybe eight of it now in the movie. Very little, right. less. Um, so there's not a lot of the concerto that actually could have been adapted into the score. The score, in fact, uses the theme, his theme, but uh, outside of that, uh, a lot of what's going on in the underscore has, is not directly taken from the, the concerto. Yeah. There's, a, there's quite a little, uh, a lot of electronic stuff in there as well and some more dissonance. Uh, yeah, there's some electronic stuff, uh, multiple flutes and that. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, I think a, a you know a, a, a flute uh, a quintet that plays sort of in the lower register. Um, there's a wooden uh, you know exotic flute that I played on you right. know uh, which I do in a lot of films. Either playing these flutes or or singing. I sing a lot in, yeah. in the films yes, in or the, moan or do something yes, weird. Very vomiting noises in there. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Very unusual vomiting noises. Yeah, the vomiting the noises, all yeah. these weird yeah. sounds. Is, <laughs> uh, but uh, so the flute was an important part of this. And then there was a modified, electronically modified flute, which every time we see him actually playing the flute, hmm. that was um, done by screwing around with a, with a uh, C flute or an alto flute, alto flute. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have to also talk about Nosferatu. Okay. About great horror scores. Um, this is a fantastic, just the entire circumstances around it and how you got involved with it and just what you're doing with it now is just wonderful. Um, had you 
seen the original film back in the day? I mean, obviously it's, you know, it's a classic of the horror genre. What did you know about it before you got involved in Nosferatu? I'm embarrassed to say, as much as I'm a fan of genre films, dark movies, scary movies, ghost stories are my favorites. My favorite black and white film uh, that's supposed to scare you a bit is The Haunting, the original mm -hmm. black and white Robert Wise directed Haunting. Uh, I have, a, as you probably know, a massive collection of classic ghost story books. Right. They're not here, they're in storage now. Um, but uh, of all the, the, the creatures of the night uh, that are well known, vampires were never tops on my list. Really? Never. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so that indeed when the call came and said, what do you think about rescoring Nosferatu? I, you know, of course I knew what Nos, I knew what the movie was, but I'd never seen it. Right. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but what a canvas. I mean, it's a, obviously it's a silent film, so the music has to yeah. guide all the emotion in the story. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, that, yeah. That's, that must be a composer's dream. Oh yeah, that was, that was, and there was two things that made that, well, a number of things that made that an absolute dream come true. One is no dialogue, no sound effects. Like you said, it's just the music and the image. Um, number two was uh, the instructions were, um, Don't worry so much about catching things on the screen. Rather, we want you to write a symphony of horror, you know, in which you're playing the bigger picture of what's going on, you know, the sub, the emotional subtext. Uh, so, you know, that gave me the permission to do contrary to what you normally do in horror films, which is, oh, here comes the knife, you right. gotta catch Hit that. Points, Hit yeah. that, all these sync points. Yeah. It was, don't worry about the sync points. There are some sync points, but very few, very few. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was concerning, you know, it concerned me. Uh, that, that was what they were encouraging, but uh, I just wasn't sure if it was gonna fly with the audience. Um, and I even remember, you know, I, the way, in order to get it done in the short time that I had, uh, I originally uh, realized it as a piano reduction. And so there's a piano version of the entire thing, multi-track with me playing. And, and it's pretty rock solid. Okay? And it's a, it's a, it's a, a synthesized piano so I could fix the performances. Um, but the first, the guy who was the lead orchestrator on this uh, came in, uh, and he's, he was great. Um, this Costas, Costas Christmas. Cost, Costas was, yeah, and, and, David, and Dave Shepard. He was actually the lead guy. And he came in and saw the piano version to picture. And he, he was the first one who said, well, Chris, you know, <laughs> It's not catching a lot. I think you better rethink this. Right. And, and I, of course, my uncle Poom, he was the first outsider to, to, to hear it. And, yeah, no. Um, but it does have scope. I mean, the, the, the film itself has, has scope that it can support you know, such a large orchestral yes. ensemble, I think. Yes, yes, it can. And ultimately, it wasn't until it was performed live when I realized that the audience was liking the way the music was playing with the picture. Yeah. And sometimes it's a stretch. The biggest instance of it being kind of a stretch is the beginning of the movie. Everyone's, it's a hap, you know, have you seen, you've seen it, right? A long time ago. A long yeah. time ago, okay. Well, it's, a, it's, it's boyfriend, girlfriend, are they wife and husband, wife? No, I think they're boyfriend, girlfriend, kissing a lot and happy, everything's right. great, life is wonderful, right. the butterflies, the birds. <laughs> and, and I did not score that smiley with smiley music. Right. 
And I remember Paul talking to him, you know, Paul is, he heard what I did and he goes, what are you doing to this? <laughs> I said, Paul, you know, you know, we know what's, what's going to happen yeah, here. Foreshadowing. I foreshadow yeah. the fact that it's not going to turn out well, right. but there's this eminent mystery that surrounds everything having to do with Nosferatu from the first frame to the last frame. Yeah. And so that was the hurdle that we all had to get, that they had to get over. Well, he had to get over, you know, um, but... One of the things I like about it is that you, it, it's almost like you're going out of your way to humanize Nosferatu. You're almost like played to his tragedy a lot of the time as well. Yeah. A lot of romanticism in the music, which, you know, you don't get from a lot of horror scores, especially horror scores from back in the day. They very much treated monsters as monsters. You're treating the monster almost as like a, a tragic anti-hero. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, as... We all know the greatest of the great monsters are actually just tragic figures. People yeah. no different than you and I, who just happen to be trapped in these hideous bodies. Right. Uh, you know, they, in all of them, we, we have to sympathize for the character. And yes, um, Dracula, Nosferatu, vampires, tragic figures. Frankenstein, tragic, Wolfman, definitely tragic. Right. I don't know enough about the mummy. I don't know if the mummy was a tragic figure. <laughs> I probably. probably. Yeah. Um, but my favorite uh, uh, movies that I've worked on, if there's a, an evildoer, mm -hmm. if there's a sense of tragedy connected with them, that's yeah. great because that immediately gives you, as a composer, the ability to address the interior of, of the person, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, just thinking Nightmare on Elm Street with Freddy Krueger. Mm. Nah, there's not, you know. No, but, the, but Pinhead does. Pinhead, yes, Absolutely Pinhead. he does. Pinhead um, does. Know, especially Hellraiser 2, when you start getting the stuff with his alter ego, Elliot, and you're bringing that aspect out. It's, right, yeah. right. Anyway, we're digressing. Um, let's, let's go back to Nosferatu. Tell me about your performance in Basel. That Matt must have been a, a tremendous experience seeing that performed live for the first time. Right, in, in uh, Switzerland. In Switzerland. Yeah, 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 in Switzerland. Um, yes, that was a miraculous evening. I would have to say that that is, well, first of all, it's the, it's the only evening uh, I've experienced, or that anyone's who experienced that was in the room of nothing but my music. You know, I've, I've had stuff played in concerts, but it's usually a small bit and a bigger, and an evening of a lot of different things. Right. But this was 93 minutes nonstop of my music. Yeah. Um, so that was incredible. Uh, the orchestra got into it completely. I think they loved it. Um, yeah, uh, I, we, it wasn't, it wasn't Frank, the, the conductor did not do it to click. Uh, I have never seen anything quite like him because he was completely, he'd made notes on the score and he never was off, never was off. Not with the aid of streamers, not with a click. It was phenomenal. Yeah. And. I, I just was amazed, you know, how it all got, because I remember, mm, I go there, the first rehearsal, oh my God, and, you know, the, I still haven't learned the lesson that when they read, when the orchestra reads through a new piece of music for the first time, the best thing a poser can do is get the hell out of the room. Because <laughs> they're working out all the kinks. Oh, yeah, they're working out all the kinks. Yeah. They play it really loud, and they're sawing, and they're yeah. chatting at the same time. And <laughs> it's like, oh, no, no. What have I done? And we were talking, I was talking to <laughs> Costas and Dave. I said, guys, we got we to gotta take the breath. It's overwhelming. It's too tense. Right. And, and, and I remember, you know, Frank said, calm down, Chris. It's going to be fine. <laughs> and it was like, we didn't have many rehearsals. It was it was nutty how little time we had to rehearse. I think it was by the third. They were in three-hour blocks, 
And it was the third three-hour block when all of a sudden we were like, yeah, in, um, yeah, it clicked. All of a sudden it clicked. And the orchestra got it, and boom, it was smooth sailing. So tell me about your Kickstarter campaign. You're trying to get parts of this re-recorded so that you can then release it. Right, proper right. That was put together because, interesting, when I, when, when I was there for the concert, I was told that, there was, that it could not be recorded. And so, um, well, oh, please, we got to record this. Anyway, they put up some mics at the last minute and recorded it. Uh, they had someone there monitoring it, but it wasn't treated like a legitimate real recording session. Right. And uh, then, and it was two nights, a, f a Friday and a Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, I can't remember what, two nights. And we, we tried to edit together the best performances of both nights. Uh, but there were definite mistakes, and um, some of the changes that were made to the to the orchestrations of certain passages never made it on the stands in time. Mm -hmm. In addition, the, because it was a, a, a last minute recording affair, right. no microphones were put on the organ, and so. Uh -huh. uh, what you've heard, what you've heard is is a is a fake overdub piano, you know, really? uh, organ, right. and I could you know, that could be done, but not in a ninety-three minute piece. It gets maddening. So the re-recording that we need to do is to correct the errors mm. in the orchestration and in the performances, of which there were numerous ones re-record the organ so that we can finally hear it because hey you know it's a horror score organ and orchestra yeah. that's the other thing that made it special yeah, it's a classic combination yeah it is a classic combination um and you know originally i had dreams of bringing in some exotic group of instruments but i was told cannot do it's a standard group the only thing that we've got that's that that's in the hall itself that you could use is the organ. I said, oh, oh okay, that's cool. We'll do that. So one final topic that I just want to talk about a little bit is is the, your relationship to horror in general. I mean, yes. obviously, you know, you've written so many classic horror scores over the years. You know, we mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street 2, we mentioned Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2, Bless the Child, Species, Drag Me to Hell, all these classic scores. Yes. Um, I also love a lot of the stuff that you've done in other genres. You know, I love Madrid first and a lot of the jazz stuff that right. you've done. But I'm just curious as like a, a philosophical thing. What do you think it is about your music that lends itself so well to the horror genre? Because all your stuff that we've done this year, Nosferatu and the Piper, and also The Offering, all great horror scores. What do you think it is about your own music that... Well, it's probably a number of things. And boy, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, I've, I've mentioned it before, you know, being involved in horror is both a blessing and a curse in many ways. I love it. Oh, I love it so much, but I hate it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, now, what, what, why do I maybe keep coming back? to the genre, why do I keep getting calls? Why is it that my voice seems to resonate with directors and studios when it comes to time to making sure the audience gets scared? Well, I'm gonna list a few things, is that okay? Please. Okay. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I've had music in my head. I th I'm assuming that it wasn't the first thought that went through my head, but it might, probably the second right. one. It's always been there. It's never left me. It's my best friend. You know how music is. You're down in the dumps. What's the first thing that tries to come to the rescue to make you feel good is music. Um, but at the same time, I always had a fascination with Halloween when I was younger. I don't know where it came from. 
because it was certainly, there was nothing in the family that it would indicate that I would take a, a fancy to that. And it was more the what goes on at night when the sun goes down and trying to imagine as a child the, you know, the infinite mystery that is out there, the un, unknowable, the unanswerable question. Right. And that stays with, has stayed with me. Now, in terms of my films, I still think when I work on a film that the first thing that I try to do is, is, is connect with that, that uh, mysterious world that lies beyond the flat image, the space in which this story takes place. Right. And, and often the directors, though they won't say it uh, directly in so many words, what they're trying to encourage me to do is bring to the picture this haunted depth that somehow, for one reason or another, is not quite there. Um, I've said this before, there's that H.P. Lovecraft quote that I adore, which is the oldest fear known to mankind. Oh, the oldest emotion known to mankind is fear. And the greatest fear of them all uh, is that of the unknown. Mm. That's kind of paraphrasing. Right. But this whole element of the unknown yeah. and trying to, to take an adventure beyond the curtain you know, into this dark universe. So that's always there. Uh, number two is um, the language of that's often used for scary scores is this modern, you know, clustery kind of stuff that you hear in concert music, you know, 60s to 70s. Dissonance is still prevalent in concert music. I love that stuff. Right. I loved Penderecki. I love Ligeti, Ludoslavsky, Zanakis, this whole team of people that were into this dissonance stuff. Yeah. Uh, as I've often said that the, you know, when I first heard Penderecki's music, I wasn't frightened, rather I was enlightened. Because mm. to me it was the voice of God, right. you know. Um, so. I believe that's deep inside of me and it, it is there and I love it. A lot of composers who take a stab at, at doing horror really don't like that language. And you have to love it, I think. Um, the next thing is, and this has been pointed out to me by fans, they'll say, well, in so many of your scores, you don't treat the people in the film as if they were just cardboard cutouts that are just there to get chopped up by the bad guy. You know, rather, like you said, there's tragedy that usually happens to these characters, and somehow I try to connect with that, the inner turmoil of, of the person to whom all this evil stuff is happening. Emily Rose just popped into my head you know, about a, a poor girl who was a college student who gets possessed by the devil and ultimately dies. Mm -hmm. She's a wonderful, sweet, happy, loving woman. Right. And this That's was not an emotional meant... journey. I mean, that in itself is like the full human spectrum of emotion. Yeah, it's just, it's a, yeah. it's a human story in, in, in the, in the uh, shape of a scary, you know, scary film. Uh, so there's that. Uh, I... I love the idea of, I'm, I'm, I'm a dramatic guy, I love dramatic music, mm -hmm. music that jumps out, doesn't pussyfoot. Right. And so if it's a screamer and they want the music to scream, I'm there, yeah. kaboom. Yeah. You know. There was that period of time back in the Hellbound days and, and the Invaders from Mars days where I was uh, looking to create this, this, um, impenetrable wall of sound, of dark sound. Yeah. And so a lot of the hell bounce, the, oh, really, yeah. you know, a lot of this wall started yeah. tearing at you. Yeah. And uh, that's exciting. Yeah. You know? That's why like, people respond to it so well. You think so? Yeah. It's like the Phil, I felt like that was the Phil Spector of horror. You know? <laughs> the wall of sound. The horrific wall of sound. Yeah, that <laughs> terrific, horrific wall of sound. Oh, yeah. yeah. If Phil Spector had done horror scores, this is maybe what he would have done. Yeah. 
So I love all that. I've calmed down, you know. Now I'm looking for how to achieve the creeps with minimal, right. you know, which is great. I mean, that's sort of the new movement in right. art. That, that takes a different set of skills entirely. I mean, the stuff that you were doing on Sinister with all those, like, yeah, all right. those sound effects and... And even just last year from the offering, what you were doing with other... Which, the which one? For the offering from last year. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was all, okay. I mean, two different horoscopes yeah. completely, but they're both you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think, I think that's what it is. And I'm going to end this by saying, I still think that though I've done, I don't know how many horror films, um, if I agree to take it, a horror film on, I... Uh, insist, I think insist in me that I'm going to try to make it better than the last one. I don't think there's any score that where I've just sort of said, well, fluff that one off. Right. You know? And I think that's one of the things that the fans have caught is that they see that there's a genuine effort yeah. each yeah. time to come up to bat with whatever I've got. That's just, uh, I, you know, um, and try to hit a home run. Try. I'm not saying I'm the only person that does this. There's tons of thousands of composers that do this. It's just something that I've always taken pride in. The score may not be the greatest, but the effort is genuine. Well, you certainly succeeded this year with the pipe front. Chris, thank you very much. Congratulations. I can't thank you enough. This is this is means the world to me. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you.